Okay, most people in the West take whatever they have for granted. People have tapped water, people have got electricity, they just slip a switch and they have lighting in their place. You find that a family has been here with their pole 20 meters away for five years and they don't have access to electricity. People yeah. have to, to wait for two hours to fetch water. Like if you have a bucket of 20 liters, you have to wait for one hour, two hours. They can't even afford electricity. They can't afford clean water. They can't afford food. We want to beat hunger. We want to beat poverty. We want to have tapped water. Cool. Well, good morning there, Jasper Machogu. How are you today, my buddy? My buddy, it's really good to have you as a, a guest today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, yeah. I look forward to having a chat with you. Oh, but it's so cool. I love Twitter in many ways because it's opened up my sort of network to amazing people. And I think it was about maybe like two months ago, Adam Rossi, he shared a post of yours. And like straight away, I was like, this is my man. I have to follow him and I like what he's saying. And now here we are chatting. So that's super cool. And and you're sitting in your backyard there in Kenya. It looks like a little bit of a cold morning. How is it there for you today? It's good. Uh, a little bit chilly. It hasn't rained, I think, in the past uh, two months. It has rained maybe twice or thrice. Uh, but I think now the rains are back. It's cold. <laughs> cool stuff. So, but look, there's nothing like starting a podcast with a good African story around bribery, right? So we both know that in Africa, like, the way to get things done sometimes is through bribes. Sometimes that's the only way to get things done. Now, I know that you have a very interesting story about an orphanage that you were building, but uh, you didn't pay a bribe uh, and that got you in a little bit of trouble, I'm assuming. Last year, we were building these three orphans, three kids who live all alone without no parent, uh, nobody to look after them, no guardian. And so we were building them a beautiful house uh, because they have a tiny plot. So we tried to ensure that the building will be like a permanent structure, not the mud structure that we have around here. The government guys, the county council told us we had to pay a bribe. I actually went there with my dad and my sibling and my engineer. We tried talking to them. We were like, oh, man, we, we, are, we are doing this beautiful work for these children. Why don't you allow us to to continue doing that minus paying a bribe because like we're giving them money and then adding no value to whatever we are doing they don't come to inspect or supervise or anything you just give them money but they said no we went out we, we went back home and then the following day the following day they took some stuff from uh the people who were working there um and they took with them three three people so we went like the whole village got up, we went to the county offices, we were demanding questions like, why did you take our people? Why did you take our staff? What do you want? We want our people back uh, and our staff back. And of course, we're not going to pay a bribe. And uh, after that, uh, they took hold of me and some other guys, so five people, five in total, and then they took us to... Um, to a cell. I slept in a cell uh, overnight for doing good work. Yeah, and then the following day, we were taken to court, but then uh, in the courtroom, the guys said, okay, we have talked to each other and we have, uh, like, came to terms. Like, we don't have a problem. So, there was no, like, hearing or anything. That was the end of it. We were told, okay, you go back home. And that was it. I, I know it happens a lot in Africa. Like every other place you go to, somebody needs a bribe. Like if you want your passport to come out quickly, pay a bribe if you want if you want something. Like right now I'm waiting for good conduct for two two members for my uh, organization, Fossil Fuels for Africa. So if I had paid a bribe, the good conduct certificate would have come out quickly, but yeah, uh, I can only wait. But it's crazy. I remember like when I was still living in South Africa years ago, like I was, I was, you know, a youngster. And uh, if you got caught like driving, you know, over the speed limit and the, the cops pulled you over, I, I mean, you, all you had to do was really just like open up your wallet and then show them like, you know, okay, cool. He has a hundred rand. And they'll go, okay, cool. Yeah, that's enough. 
and and they would just let you go. <laughs> it's just like, and that's just the way business is sometimes in Africa. If you came to Kenya, that is the case actually. Like today, we have like uh, the the traffic police everywhere. But these people, they don't ask for. Usually, whenever we we have boarded matatus, matatu is uh, the PSV pass, passenger service vehicle. So whenever you board a matatu, you realize that the matatu uh, stops at the police check. And then the conductor, the, the person who, who's collecting money and stuff like that, gives the, the, the police like 50 shillings. That's about um, almost a dollar, half a dollar, 50 cents. So it gives them uh, the 50 shillings and off we go. Like this, the, the police are not going to check if we are, like the, if the, the vehicle is overloaded. They don't care about the speed, the condition, if we have insurance. They don't care about that as much as as long as you've given them that tip. That is it. That's how we operate, man. Oh, that is crazy. Like people that live in say like the Western world would probably just have no idea how to survive. I think in in Africa, but it's just it's just kind of the way it is, isn't it? So so look, uh, obviously, I think uh, good things run in your blood. Like you are definitely a guy that likes to help people. And I just want to read a couple of things, a couple of tweets that you actually wrote. And then I got a couple of questions afterwards um, because it's kind of a nice um, platform to ask your questions off. So you wrote, uh, good morning from Kisi, Kenya. Half the bananas are ripe. I left another bucket of bananas ripening up this, in the ceiling. It has been a couple of hot sunny days without rain. It drizzled over the weekend for a few minutes. Yesterday, my borehole water pump ran for two hours straight because people needed lots of water. And then you have a separate, a separate one where you, you, you wrote a, another um, um, tweet saying, I'm still providing free clean water to my community. I would want to own a four-wheel tiny tractor and browser so that I can provide clean water to more fami families effortlessly, effortlessly, effortlessly. Well, that's a hard word. <laughs> um, at a price even the poorest will afford easily. So how did like this idea around the borehole come about for you? My campaign, my advocacy for fossil fuels for Africa is all about just stopping toil and ensuring that Africans have like the, the best. Okay, most people in the West take whatever they have for granted. People have tapped water. People have got electricity. They just flip a switch and they have lighting in their place. They do have laundry machines. They do have uh, dishwashers. They do have all of these great benefits thanks to fossil fuels. But when you come to Africa, it's it's a different story, or like a totally different story. So where I come from, most of about I'd say about ninety percent of more than ninety percent of my the, my community earn a livelihood from agriculture. Like these are people who wake up in the morning, go to their farm, pluck tea, or weed their maize, or harvest their finger millet, uh, or Actually, like most families own a cow or two, so they have to also wake up in the morning and get napia or some grass for their cattle. So that's what my community is all about. And that's what six to seven uh, out of 10 Africans, and that's how six to seven out of 10 Africans earn a livelihood. Like they are, they are earning a livelihood thanks to agriculture. As I campaign for just stopping toil, that means we need farm machines like this is 2024 but you come here and you find people digging throughout the day like somebody goes to their farm he has got a hole and it's up down up down throughout the day that's what my mom does actually that's what i do whenever i go out farming so we toil a lot uh and as as I just I just said, one of the problems that we have is water around here. I know in some other places it's worse. In some other places in Kenya it's worse. People get to, uh, going for water from fetching water from our, uh, maybe two kilometers away, one kilometer away. Luckily for us, we fetch water from about six hundred meters. My home fetches water from about six hundred meters away uphill. In Kisi, it's just hills everywhere, so it's uphill. At some other point, you have to, it's, it's tough work. But some other families go fetch water from one kilometer away because like I'm, I'm just near the river. We have other families on the other side. 
And uh, I felt like the first problem I need to solve is like if the first problem I need to stop to end toil is by getting a borehole for my community. I got, I, I dug a borehole last year thanks to help from some of my friends. And uh, yeah, so people don't have to go fetching water uh, 600 meters away, one kilometer away. They come here at the river. So where we get water from the spring, sometimes, especially during the drought seasons, we have like a very low discharge, very low. People have to, to wait for two hours to fetch water. Like if you have a bucket of 20 liters, you have to wait for one hour, two hours, some other times. And I remember, actually, I was sharing this story with a friend uh, over the weekend. So when I was growing up, my mom would wake up at three in the morning. She would go to the river and she gets there. She finds very many people waiting for, waiting in line to fetch water. So you can imagine waking up at three in the, in the morning. During the day, it's it's even more chaotic, like you're going to wait for three hours or something. I got this borehole for my community uh, as a way of ending toil. So people now travel for maybe 300 meters and it's just flat land because uh, most people live uh, along the hill. They get clean, free water easily. It's ending toil in a way. It must like really kind of change their lives, you know, and, and sort of even in a way like free them up a little bit because they don't have to walk the 600 meters or wait the two hours to to get water. So it must be a huge help to them. Yeah, it is. And you you wrote about like uh, also maybe thinking about getting sort of pipes and stuff from your borehole to, I guess, help the community sort of make it even easier for them to get water. Is that has that sort of progressed at all? Yeah, one, one family already has got tapped water at their place. It's my neighbor over here. And uh, I'm, I'm, okay, so I had, Initially, I was thinking about maybe getting a tractor at some point in life, uh, and and maybe a bausa the, the 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 tank, and so getting water to these families is the tractor carrying water to their places, and then maybe asking them for a, a service fee or something. But I think tap water is going to be far cheaper, and uh, yeah, like. Getting, so digging trenches, installing pipes and getting these pipes to particular families and maybe installing them a water meter so that I can monitor how much they consume per, let's say, per month and then charging them for, you know, uh, a cubic meter uh, of water. That will be far easier and convenient and like Getting tap water is, is it's 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 a game changer. It is. It's life changing. I, I listened to this really fascinating podcast years ago, and it was talking about like the sort of biggest changes in society, right? And one of the biggest changes in society ever was actually um, getting sort of piped water everywhere, and and that was also a reason that so much disease actually sort of stopped was because people then had like clean running water they weren't going you know to wherever it was to to get their water so like what you're doing is is like twofold you, you're giving people well water on tap which is life-changing but also probably helping with other other issues you know maybe related around to disease and sicknesses and stuff that they can avoid so i think it's amazing talking about disease um, another thing that we have been trying to do fossil fuel for africa has been trying to do is getting people Clean cooking because over here people cook using firewood uh, in houses that don't have chimneys. So you can imagine what that what that that does to them. For the past uh, for the past like almost a year, we have been trying to for the past one year we have been trying to get families clean cooking. So it's just the, the LPG can six kilos. Six kilos is like a tiny one, but it, it supports families for about one month. Uh, if they're cooking breakfast, lunch, and supper using the, the LPG can. So a family of six members is going to to use that uh, for about, uh, let's say, four weeks, three, four weeks, five weeks. And they, once their LPG can 
runs out, they refill in nearby kiosks or shops uh, by paying about $10. So that is affordable for most families. I'd, I'd say it's affordable to all, almost all families in my community. So it's, it's, it's a game changer as well. For the past uh, one year, we managed to give out about 100 LPG cans, so 100 to 100 families, some, some good work. Also, we have been giving out, um, we have been connecting people to the grid, to the national grid, electricity grid. The situation over here is different. So we have families, like it's a, it, I have my home, I have a pole here, so I don't need like another line. I don't need to construct anything. I don't need to buy materials. I don't need to buy poles and get an electrician to connect poles, you know, I don't need all of that. So it's just like my home is just near nearby a, a pole, maybe 20 meters away, 30 meters away or something of the sort. But you find that a family has been here with their pole 20 meters away for five years and they don't have access to electricity. They're not connected to the grid. And this is because these families lack about $300 to connect themselves to the grid. So with $300, you can get an electrician, buy materials, uh, the wiring materials, buy, get yourself a meter uh, from Kenya Power and Lightning Company, KPLC. And that is going to change your lives. But you don't have access to the 300 USD. So most families don't have access to electricity. So for the past one year, we have been trying to get these families connected to the grid. For the past maybe seven months, we have been getting the those closest to the lines. So we, for the past six months, we haven't been con uh, constructing lines or building lines. We have been we have been just connecting wherever is near. Uh, the, the the national grid line to the electricity, you know. But we have also connected people. We have built lines uh, in the past and got those families connected to the grid. This, those are families who, in maybe ten years, they wouldn't had they wouldn't have had the funds to build a line because building a line is the most expensive um, thing that you're going to do. If you're building a line. Five poles, five times, that's like 1,500 USD. Five poles, 1,500 USD. Families can't, they, there is no way they're going to get that. Yeah, so you can imagine a family saving, say, 200 USD a year. And, and those are rich families, I'd say, in my community. 200 USD in a year. That means you don't have kids in school. You don't have... Um, Let's say young kids. You don't have young kids in school, and that is it. If you have kids in school, there is no way you're going to save 200 USD. Actually, you're going to have, you're going to be in debt because, like, you can't. There is no way you're going to take your kids to school at the same time, affording their their um, clothing, food, all of that. Most people think that climate change is what we should be worried about, but. Nobody over here is worried about climate change and stuff like that. Exactly. That's what people don't understand. Like people that are like, you're yeah, pushing your climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Like, well, actually there's like, I don't know what the percentage of the population is. Maybe, I don't know, 60, 70% of the population are, it's, it's the last of their worries. You know, they're worrying about, can I uh, put food on the table tonight? Uh, can I turn on the lights? Do I even have access to turn on the lights? Um, you know what I mean? Like their worries are so different and, uh, it's just kind of mind blowing how, uh, yeah, some people are just so disconnected from the reality of most people in the world. I always say like almost every single human, I reckon, maybe not, maybe not, uh, you guys are used to it, but like almost every single human, like they would struggle to survive a night, like say outside of their house, if they had to go like in the bush for a night they would almost not be able to survive, right? Um, but like, even if we say we, we, we send, say, people to your community, they would struggle. Like, I mean, the fact that they, they don't have hot water <laughs> or even running water or can, I don't know, charge their phone or something would be, it would be like the most anxious sort of creating sort of environment for them and they just wouldn't survive. So like, I reckon, yeah, it's a, it would be a good lesson to to actually, you know, 
tell people, cool, come, you must come and see how most of the people in, in this world actually live. And then you can start chirping and lecturing on on these other sort of things that you think are big, big issues in the world. The funny bit is that most of the people, like the policies that we have, the anti-human, the anti-African policies that we have, those policies are not formulated by Africans. They are formulated by people who have never been, I'd say, in a farm. It beats me that the people formulating policies for us they don't understand where we come from, how we do things. A good example, last year I was chatting up with this. So last year, let me start with this. So last year, uh, FAO Africa, like they were congratulating this lady for doing like a beautiful report or something, um, policy report. So the lady, I think she was from the Netherlands or some country in Europe. I texted her and asked her, are you a farmer by any chance? Because like these are the people who are making policies for us. And she told me, oh, they used to own farmland at some point in life, but they sold that land. And so, so you can imagine, this, those are the same people who are making policies for us. This, those are the same people telling us not to use fertilizer that they use in plenty. Those are the same people telling us that living sustainably, like me going to the farm at eight in the morning and working my way, all like working my I, I, I don't want to say my ass off. You just said it. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> yeah. So working my ass off from eight in the morning to say five in the evening, living that way, living sustainably is is a good thing. If like, so most people are working from eight in the morning to say one or two in the afternoon and like a dollar or one dollar and 50 cents. You can imagine that. It's crazy. It's the same thing with the UN. Uh, I, I think you have heard of the Sustainable Development Goals by the UN. 17 problems, 16 plus climate change, actually. And out of these problems, because, okay, so Sustainable Development Goals for developing countries. It's for developing countries. And you can imagine that climate change is one of those big problems. Uh, yeah, it's one of those big problems, according to the UN. And so the, their solutions to these 17 problems is just centered around climate change. If you're going to solve hunger, how do we do it in a way that we don't hurt the environment or something? We don't change the climate. If we're going to uh, solve clean water, clean cooking, uh, education, how do we do it in a way that we don't impact the environment? We don't change the climate. It's crazy. I, I, but the people who are advocating for that, I do have a sustainable develop uh, a sustainable internship program running happening in Kisi, Kenya. If you want to live sustainably, please be my guest. If you want to fetch water from 600 meters away, be my guest. If you want to fetch firewood from underneath trees, you know the tree sticks, the twigs. If you want to, if you want to do that, be my guest. If you want to test what it is like to dig from eight in the morning to say one in the afternoon, be my guest. If you want to live sustainably, let me put it like that, be my guest. I have that for you. And Aveti, I, I think you've had, you've actually sort of challenged a couple of people or more than a couple of people. You've challenged a lot of people uh, to attend your sustainability internship. And I don't even know if any have bothered uh, sort of applying or, or getting back to you. So far, I've had two interns and the two, so one from Iran and another one from the US. But the two people, they came here because like they wanted to, to try it, you know, they were not the kind of people who were like, uh, living sustainably is a good thing. These are people who understand, like the person come, the lady coming from Iran, she understands what hard life is like. Like she knows life is hard, you know. Uh, anyway, so so far I've invited great uh, Michael Man who blocked me. Uh, there is a guy from Canada. I remember the name. You name them. I've I've invited them. Uh, Sophia Kiani. She, I think she works with the UN or something. Uh, Guterres, Antonio Guterres himself. Kamala Harris. I've also invited the dad to Kamala Harris. He's politely said no because he told me his his age can't allow him can't allow him to you know live sustainably but the rest i've i've never heard from them most of them ended up blocking me 
or uh, yeah, they ignored me. I often think that sort of academic types that are putting out these reports are pretty much the ultimate keyboard warriors because their their lives are so like separate to reality. Uh, they've never stepped into the day, you know, the life of a day like you like yourself. You know what I mean? Um, where they've actually gone to a farm or I don't know, like, you know, just, just done something like that, that, uh, they're, they're writing about. They, they, they actually have no real life experience of what they're writing about. It's all around, I don't know, whatever they read, uh, data that is produced. And a lot of it is just like, yeah, they just have no sense of reality. And, um, that's the problem with a lot of these policies that are coming out these days is that none of it actually, uh, yeah reflects what is happening in real day life um and yeah it's a it, it's a big issue i would say because you know it's impacting the lives of many many people these policies and it's also just like a big money grab i would say like they are you know they they're giving you this tax and that tax and that tax and it's it's not actually going to anything useful at all it's uh we need like some sort of massive either pushback or, or revolution uh, to kind of wake these people up, I think. My solution is the sustainable uh, internship program. I think that's going to change most of these people's thinking because like no matter how much you you try to convince them, because whenever I argue with some of these people on Twitter, on X, we I'm, I'm giving them facts, I'm giving them the data, but most of them end up ignoring it and saying, okay, uh, organic farming is good. And like you, you, you showing this person if that's what I'm doing. So my Twitter is just full of, you know, me doing stuff sustainably, me getting organic manure from, you know, our cow, our cow shed, uh, or me fetching firewood or us plucking tea throughout the day or me getting, uh, harvesting finger millet or maize, stuff like that. So I'm showing these people how living sustain what living sustainably is like, and I'm giving them past hand like I'm 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 doing it, and I'm showing you how we do it, and I'm telling you it's not a good life because like we're earning so little from it. Most families can they just surviving day by day day by day. They can't even afford electricity. They can't afford clean water. They can't afford food, and, and these people still they they can't hear it. So that's why like I think making these people uh, drink what they preach. If you're preaching wine, go ahead and drink wine. If you're preaching organic farming, why don't you do organic farming? If you do, you're preaching climate change, like we have to find a way to ensure that these people, the people formulating policies or preaching stuff live that kind of life. So if, if I was preaching sustainable living, that would make a lot of sense because I'm, I'm you will see the benefits. I, I think somehow social media has got a big role to play, especially TikTok. So I'm not on TikTok, but I know it's just videos throughout the day. So from time to time, I meet people. I meet this on Instagram because I'm on, on, I'm on Instagram. I, I see these videos of people, you know, like young people showing off what it is like to own a farm or what it is like to mill cacao. So, and and the way they make those videos, like you watch somebody milking a cow and you're like, oh, that's the kind of life I should be living. I shouldn't be on a computer or I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be going to university studying. I should be milking cows. Or you see somebody hoeing their land and you're like, I should be, that's what I should be doing. That's I, I know that's the case for most uh, Westerners. So whenever they watch those videos, they feel like that that's the kind of life that, life that we should be living. We should let Mother Nature, that's what they say, we should let Ma Mother Nature provide. It, it's different out here. It's totally different. How, where is the middle ground? Like, how, do, how does this work in, in, in reality then? Like, because, you know, it, it is nice to say, like, let's, let's have like a, a good environment, clean environment. Uh, eat healthy food, et cetera, et cetera. But like, where is the middle ground in your opinion? Well, let me talk for myself. Let me talk for my mom. So for us, we're all about 
flourishing. We're all about developing. We want to beat hunger. We want to beat poverty. We want to have like a good life. We want to have tapped water. We want to stop toiling. We don't want to go to and work from eight in the morning, hoeing from eight in the morning to one in the afternoon or waiting our finger millet from eight in the morning to to one to five in the evening. We don't want to do that. We want better opportunities. We want industries because like industrialization changes lives in a big way. We want value addition for, we want industries to value add our produce so that we can earn more from agriculture. We want fertilizer so that we don't have to carry manure, uh, which is very, very heavy and it has got a very low nitrogen content and all of that. We don't want that. We, we want a fertilizer that is going to flourish, that is going to feed our crops in, in, like in, 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 in a better way, in a big way. And of course, we have the solutions to some of those problems. So, Whatever problems that we have, that we are facing in Africa, we have the solutions to them. And uh, the solution actually is fossil fuels, because with fossil fuels, we have the energy. With energy, you can do a lot of things. You can have tractors, you can have industries, you can have clean cooking with a lot of things. Let me put it like that. You can even have electricity. So that's number one. With fossil fuels, we can better agriculture. How do we better agriculture? We have synthetic fertilizers, nitrogenous fertilizers, which have a very a very high nitrogen content, and that's what the crop needs, NPK. So we have synthetic fertilizers, and of course, uh, the nitrogen the nitrogen bit of it is from um, uh, natural gas or let's say fossil fuels. Farm machines, farm machines uh, that run on diesel. Diesel, diesel is fossil fuels. That's what we want. We want irrigation, irrigation, the piping, the greenhouses. Uh, that is fossil fuels. You know, uh, at the same time, we need value addition, as I said, industries. That is fossil fuels. You can't run industries using electricity. It's it's not working over here, actually. Uh, yeah. And, and, and the final point is... Um, the four pillars of modern civilization. We want better structures. So the four pillars, uh, cement and steel, we want better structures. Re resilient. So the structures are going to be resilient to weather and, you know, extreme weather, let's say storms, flooding and stuff like that. We can't have that minus steel and cement. The two are made by fossil fuels. We can't, you can't have the two minus fossil fuels. Uh, we also need, uh, so the four pillars, we also need plastics. Plastics are going to be a game changer. Like my bottle, my 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 water cup is made from plastics. And if you go to most families around here, you're going to find that their utensils are plastics, other than the cooking pots, the sufferias. Everything else is basically plastic because plastics enable us to live cheaply. The plastic plates cost so little. We have one dollar shoes. So you can imagine. That is what most kids are wearing nowadays. Like whenever I'm at home, even my the slippers that I'm wearing right now, they are made of plastics. One dollar. So plastics have changed our lives in, in like a, a big, big way. And uh, uh the number four is fertilizer and fertilizer is also a game changer. So yeah. That's why we need fossil fuels. I think the solution, this, what we need is just to flourish. We need to beat poverty, hunger, on, and all of those. It beats me that the UN doesn't have fossil fuels as the solution to their 17 problems, the sustainable development goals. They don't have fossil fuels as the solution to those. But with fossil fuels, we can solve the 17, the 16 problems so easily. None of these things are like new things, right? You're not inventing the wheel. Uh, it's already obviously available, like kind of, you know, to, to most of the world. Is there like a, say a problem in Africa, uh, like when it comes to, I don't know how, how like money is, um, I don't know be, what's the right way to say it. Like obviously lots of people are poor in Africa, right? But that, yeah. it doesn't have to be that way, does it? Like how do we get like 
um, is it a cultural thing? Because there are lots of people in Africa that kind of live really well, you know, like the 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 top few percent sort of thing. Um, and they seem to sort of maybe like keep the money to themselves. Is there is there other issues that is like preventing like Africans from thriving? Like, is it a structural thing? Is it a traditional thing uh, where sort of the money doesn't sort of flow down like it needs to? Number one, colonialism never really ended. We still have colonialism in Africa. It 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 changed its face. So we have new colonialism, and I think most of that today it's happening thanks to the climate change cult. Like people are just uh, blaming climate change. They're hiding behind climate change, but the policies that they formulate. A good example is what ha- what ha- what has been happening in Kenya for the past maybe three or four years. So. But the current government, Ruto, Ruto is is like a looter. He's a land grabber. He's like a big capitalist and and very very corrupt. So we've we've seen for the past one year um, the government listening to the IMF and World Bank. The World Bank is telling them do something for the environment if you want us to give you a loan. And we have like a an at a standstill nationally, we we do nothing. We just have a national tree planting day from announced from nowhere because you know the big boys said it. Uh, at the same time, so we've have we've had the IMF and World Bank say, um, if you want us to give you a loan, we, you have to end fuel and fertilizer subsidies. Or if you want your economies to be to do better and fertilize and fuel subsidies, and they ensure that that's listened to by our government. And so we've seen like energy prices go, fuel prices go very high. Even our electricity goes high that we cannot have. Most families, if like you had a, let's say a blender, you stop using it because electricity is very high. Or if you, when you wake up, you, you like, you have to time how much how 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 long you use your your lights you know because the electricity bill is going to be high that you cannot afford it so the imf and world bank have been this colonial let me let me just put it like this the imf world bank the un the three organizations the three big organizations and now the wef is coming in and i know it's going to find itself it's going to find a way uh in africa those organizations are colonial like they are the new colonizers let me let me let me leave it at that uh so the the kind of policies that we have these organizations formulating for us are anti human anti african anti development like they are focused on ensuring that africans never develop i don't know these people are convinced that once Africa develops, we're going to start using our phosphate crop because uh, that supplies the phosphorus crops need throughout the world. Uh, the, phosph- the phosphate crop in Morocco, we're going to start using, we're going to start reserving our gold. We're going to start mining our fossil fuels and using them instead of like 75% of our oil going outside, you know, or 45% of our natural gas going outside. They, they wouldn't want that. So I think it, it's a couple of factors, but it boils down to Africa never develop, Africans never developing or Africa never developing because once it does, we're going to scramble for Africans' resources, all of us. Yeah, it seems very oppressive, doesn't it? The way they sort of implement their, their rules and like, yeah, if you want this, then there's like huge strings attached. You know, you want this loan. Okay, cool. Well, you know, you're going to have to give us your your right kidney and your left arm. Um, and we know mm-hmm. that you'll never be able to sort of pay us back. Uh, so you kind of always like oppressed, you know, and you never kind of get out this, this sort of big hole. I read this fascinating book years ago called Confessions of an e- Economic Hitman. I don't know if yeah. you've ever heard of it. I think by John Perkins or something. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And it was it was fascinating. Um just understanding, I guess, how the sort of um 
first world countries, you know, namely the US and maybe say the UK and some of European countries, like they, the way they operate, like they are, they're evil really in terms of how they, um, yeah, how they structure sort of agreements to suit them. And then like, uh, as soon as you don't sort of honor that agreement, then you lose certain things like your, say your votes on the UN or whatever the story is. Like they, they had like all these crazy things and it was like, it was the biggest eye opening book I think I've ever read in my, in my life. And, uh, it opened me up to, I guess, the sort of corruption that exists and why certain countries and certain continents are the way they are. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like we're living in this renaissance period at the moment. Like I still have a lot of hope, right? Even though you can kind of look at the world right now, especially if you're looking online and you can kind of think everything is like just going downhill, you know, and they're trying to sort of like censor us and control us even more than, than ever. And, and they, maybe they are, you know, so this feels like a kind of last battle, but I still feel like there's this beautiful renaissance going on, you know? So like, say accounts like yours, where you're teaching people the reality of say sustainable farming and like why, why we do need fossil fuels. And then you have other people that are getting interested in like old traditional ways of doing things, you know, like, um, trying to, you know, just revive sort of ancient traditions or just, you know, just ways of doing things healthier. So I feel like there's this, this nice sort of like undertone and warm current that's sort of bubbling up underneath where people are like, actually, you know, we, we want to live a different life and we don't want to be controlled by whoever you people are. And, um, I don't know if you, if you feel that yourself as well in any ways. I think you've put it in a very nice way. Okay, so I, I will put it differently. We should focus on human flourishing, African flourishing. I know that's going to happen at some point in life, and I hope uh, I'm going to be like a, a part of that change, the, the, the positive change. But uh, it's going to be very tough because we have these Western organizations, big organizations and governments ensuring that Africa never develops really. So how they do that is by, uh, if like we, if we elect, okay, so they start with ensuring that the most corrupt person who is maybe vying for presidency wins. They fund that person. They're going to ensure that they're going to uh, find, you know, mainstream media to market that person. They're going to fund that person and they ensure that this person wins. And at the same time, they're going to find uh, the people behind the uh, elections, the, the gadgets, you know, the computers and stuff like that, so that it's it's a win for that person. If that person doesn't win, uh, and somebody else wins, they are going. They are going to try and uh, break that person so that that person works for them or works for their cause. If that person doesn't agree to their terms and conditions, they're going to find a way to kill that person. That 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 has been happening in Africa for very many years. Right now, we have. African leaders, a few African leaders rising up to ensure that uh, the African, an African flourishes. And uh, I see Burkina Faso, Niger, and Mali, they pushing away, uh, they chasing away the, the people who colonized them and the people who have ensured that the system, the, the, the system that the colonialists put there is still functioning. So those leaders are saying we need to, to end that. We need to change the system. We need to change the, the system so that the system works for an African. And that is working, I'd say, well, other than, of course, the very many, uh, like, uh, what is, I'm trying to find, coop or coop. Is, other yeah. than the very many yeah cool other than the very many cool attempts on those leaders but uh 
even in Kenya, we have uh, an upcoming leader is, is a youth, just like the guy from Burkina Faso. And this guy is all about, is talking about corruption. The corruption that is happening in Kenya is highlighting, is going to, is visiting projects that the government has been saying they're complete and maybe relaunching the project so that, you know, the marketing is, is good for them. Uh, so in, 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 in maybe 10 years, we're going to see, a, a, I'd say, a big changed Africa because now we're going to have youth leaders, youth leaders who understand how the game is played, uh, uh, despite the fact that the West has been playing, the Western organizations and governments have been playing this game for maybe 100 years. But all of that is going to change. I, I, I know that for sure. And by the way, for those people listening, you should know that this is the best time for you and I to be alive. This is the best time for your kids, for you to have kids. Like, just look at history. Look at what the world, what, what history has taught us. And you're going to realize that this is the best time. This is the best that uh, humans are, like, this is the best time to, for you and I to be alive because uh, we are far educated. We are far healthier. Look at the life expectancy. It's at 72 or something. Even in Africa, it's it's going up. Look at our population. The, our population is still increasing worldwide uh, from like 1 billion in 1800 or something to 8 billion today. Uh, like this is the best time for you and I to be alive. That is just it. Look at the facts. Look at the data. And that's majorly because of fossil fuels. And that's why I'm saying fossil fuels for Africa. I think, uh, yeah, people sometimes don't realize how lucky we do have it uh, these days, that's for sure. And, um, yeah, I mean, the access that most people, I guess, um, have, like, say, in the Western world to, yeah, almost everything at the, almost the press of a button, they just literally have no no idea how lucky how lucky they are in terms of, you know, the the time that they're living in. So uh, we definitely need to make the most of that. But at the same time, we also need to spread that and, and share it more with, with people that are less privileged with, than us. Um, so, yeah, there's still, there's still a ton of work to do. And I think there's lots of good people in the world. And um, the internet, while they seem to want to control it as, as much as possible um, in terms of the information that's shared, um, I always think there's going to be ways for us to to sort of circumnavigate that and to to share good things um, and sort of, you know, help to awaken people in the world. One of the cool things that I, that I really like about um, your sort of story and your brothers too, is he has a gym called uh, Bitcoin Charmer. And uh, I just want to talk a little bit about Bitcoin, but I also just want to read a bit about what you wrote. Um, you said, I'm so happy watching this video. Bitcoin Charmer is not just an idea a Bitcoin circular community in the making. If we can empower the poorest families by providing another source of revenue, what's better than beehives? They require little space and under trees. Almost every other family has their land touching the river and over 50 trees near the riverbanks. Bees don't require much attention. If families can make an extra $200 on top of the $200 they save yearly, that's a good amount of money. Calvin will buy the honey from them for Bitcoin which they can spend in two local shops that accept Bitcoin. Or even better, use Tando, which is an app, I'm assuming, if they can find themselves in, in need of KSH, which is your local currency. So mm -hmm. you said, I'm so proud of Calvin. Um, our community is flourishing, comes first. So firstly, uh, how did like you sort of even get involved in Bitcoin? Because I can imagine from a technology perspective, like, I don't know what phones you have, but like, how do you even buy it? How do you, yeah, I'd, I'd love to know, like, how you do it, how you got involved. I've had this uh, friend, he's from the US, and he's been talking to me about Bitcoin for a very long time. <clears throat> I think from last year or something, he, so before, maybe from last year, mid last year, and he was talking to me about Bitcoin and I'm like, okay, I, I, I like the technology, but how is it going to help uh, a farmer like me or farmers in my community? 
and uh, he didn't have the answer to that. So, like, why will they substitute uh, the Kenyan shilling? Because, like, I'm, I'm I have my let's say my cabbages. I cut I cut my cabbage. I take it to my neighbor. My give my neighbor gives me ten Kenyan shillings, or uh, let's say a hundred Kenyan shillings. That's about one dollar. I go to a local shop. I buy uh, I buy sugar, and that is it. That's what I basically need. Why why will they substitute? Why why will they need Bitcoin? Anyway, so last year I got, uh, I think maybe this year or last year, end of last year, December, January, I got this invitation to a Bitcoin conference in South Africa, adopting Bitcoin uh, Cape Town. I attended the conference. I actually was a speaker. And uh, man, uh, I realized that people out here, like Bitcoin had lots of benefits and uh, it had it had a big, big potential in solving, in being a part of the, the solution to Africa's problems. Do you know that? Okay, so the first time I went to South Africa, I had uh, about like 150 uh, USD with me in cash, but in Kenyan shillings. So I, I flew to South Africa. I was stuck in Cape Town, in the uh, Cape Town airport. I was just stuck there because I didn't have the run. And so I went to the currency exchange uh, shops. I was trying to convert my Kenyan shillings to rand so that I can uh, board like an Uber to my hotel. <clears throat> but that was not, uh, so the shops kept telling me, oh, what do you have? Do you have USD or uh, euros? Because like we, we can't, we, 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 we don't exchange Kenya, the Kenyan shilling. And it was like, man, I'm, I'm in Africa, but these guys cannot exchange the Kenyan shilling, but they are exchanging the, the USD, euros, uh, pounds, and, and Canadian dollars, and, 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 and Australian dollars, but they're not exchanging the Kenyan shilling. So I was stuck there until a friend came by and, you know, um, I boarded his Uber. So I've also been wondering about how, like, I, I kept wondering about that because, like, a boundary just flying through a boundary means that my Kenyan shilling, my African currency doesn't work in another African country. It, it just, the, the boundary just kills the, the, the value of the country currency, you know. So that's where Bitcoin comes in. And, and when I was doing these projects, um, especially the Bohol project, if somebody wanted to send me funds from, say, the US, they they wouldn't send uh, the funds easily. Actually, even today, if somebody tried to send me 100 USD using their bank account, it, from their US, US, the American bank account to, an, uh, to a Kenyan bank account, they would run in troubles. They maybe would have to go to their bank and maybe, uh, you know, talk to the representatives or something so that they, re- like, it's your money, but you cannot do transactions minus the bank, banks. Um, that controls. Yes, that one. So, yeah, lots of problems. Now with Bitcoin, I've come to, I've come to realize that, that with Bitcoin, it's, effortlessly like nobody controls your funds nobody's going to see how much money you have if the the kenyan government the corrupt kenyan government wanted to prevent me from using my kenyan shillings they wouldn't they they will be able to but with bitcoin they, they they can't control my bitcoin they can't control how much okay so today if if somebody's wanted to send me funds if or if i wanted to deposit funds into my bank account if I went to the bank, the bank would hold me like hostage. They would push on me. Where did you get all of, all of this money from? Uh, you know, like a lot of a lot of questions, a lot of problems. If somebody sent me a huge amount of money to my account from elsewhere, I'd have to explain why I have all of that money in my bank account. So with Bitcoin, it's different. It's your money. You do with it whatever you want to do with it. You can send it to anybody and nobody has to know how much you sent to them. 
And uh, with Bitcoin, it's instant. Like I have friends in Rwanda. I have a friend in South Africa. So whenever, like if I wanted to send funds to them, it will be instant. Like I use Bitcoin. I tell them, uh, send me your Bitcoin address and that is it. In if 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 I send by a lightning address, it's instant. Like the moment I say, okay, they have received the funds. And that is a good thing. So I feel like, the Bitcoin technology, the technology itself has got a potential, it has got a role to play in solving our trade problems. At the same time, uh, yeah, I talked about privacy, it's your money, you do with it whatever you want to do with it. And at the same time, it's all it also a good um, uh, asset when it comes to inflation, like it beats inflation in a major way. So, yeah, with all of those factors, I think that's why Bitcoin is a part of the solution to our problem. So my brother, came, so when I came to Kenya, I told my brother about my ordeal in South Africa, like I was stuck in the app, at the airport and my brother came up with Bitcoin Chama. So Bitcoin Chama is about, uh, Chama is like a community when a community comes together and maybe they put funds. So we have Chamas in Kenya, actually. Even the poorest people have Chamas. Like, they're saving a dollar every month. So it's a, like a collection of people, families or friends or people who work maybe in the agricultural sector. Let, let's just say a group of people come together. They, each of them says, I'm going to give out one dollar. I'm going to put one dollar in this basket. And so every other person puts a dollar in the basket and then we give it to one person so that because like, if you wanted to if you wanted to construct a house it will be tough for you to buy one iron sheet every month instead like if you had the group give you the, the let's say you wanted 20 iron sheets so 20 members gave you each one iron sheet so that you have now 20 iron sheets you can construct your house and then the next month now you can start giving each one of them one iron sheet but you get it yeah yeah, yeah. So that's what a chama, that's what a chama basically is. So we have the Bitcoin chama in our community. Now it's Bitcoin, it's a chama, but in Bitcoin. So we, my brother wants people to save in Bitcoin. Like we would want at some point to have like a, a Bitcoin circular community, like a community whereby we are not in, infected by, affected by inflation. Uh, and uh, yeah, privacy, privacy, man. The, the government, this government is just corrupt and it's, it's looking for ways to earn funds. It's coming up with the craziest, craziest ideas. Like even if you, you have a car, not very many, that very many people in Kenya have cars, but if you have a car, you have to pay a tax for it. Like it doesn't matter if you're using it. So every year you have to pay some money for owning that car because like you have a car. It doesn't matter if you're using it for agriculture if, or if it's, uh, a personal vehicle, like you use it maybe to go to your job or something, they don't care. So, yeah, we need to somehow uh, beat the government. Like the government is coming up with these crazy ideas. We need to beat it. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, Bitcoin Chama has got many, many uh, so some ideas to how to solve, how to make people embrace Bitcoin at the same time empowering them. And one of them is, them is the Beehive uh, project because like with a Beehive, once you have a Beehive, most families don't have, don't know how to construct a Beehive. They don't have the timber or the expertise. So once you say you have a Beehive, if, say I was given a Beehive, the only thing I need to do is install a Beehive somewhere on my farm. And that is it. I wait for six months. I find somebody to harvest the honey for me. Or as most of us do, we just get a fire and some smoke and we smoke that. And yeah, that is it. But it's it's more professional if you like, you got somebody with a, a beehive, a, what is it called? The suit, yeah. The bee suit harvesting the honey for you because this that, that person is going to know how to when to harvest the honey, how to harvest it and to ensure that the quality is just top notch, you know? Yeah, so with a beehive, a family is, say one beehive, 
with one beehive, you're going to generate up to 200 USD, actually even, even more, 200 USD per beehive. And I, as I told you, a family is saving, say, 200 US, a family without the kid, the children expenses is going to save 200 USD a year. So you can imagine another 200 USD on top of that. And with a beehive, no expenses. The bees look for their, because like it's green everywhere in, in Kisit. I know it's painted differently in mainstream media and the Western mainstream media. Whenever you hear Africa, you see drought and children dying and stuff like that. But in Kisit, green everywhere. We have trees, like every other farm, we have trees everywhere. It's green everywhere. <clears throat> and so the bees are going to get nectar from those trees and you, you, you don't feed the bees. You don't feed them. You just wait for six months, you harvest the honey and that is it. So that is a good way of ensuring that the empowering these families of my community. We also have other projects, but uh, yeah, my brother would <laughs> be the perfect person to explain his project. But uh, yeah, so Bitcoin, Bitcoin is part of the solution or the technology bit of it, the or the peer to peer transaction, and uh, you know all of those benefits. And what's the uptake been like? Have you had like lots of guys sort of buying Bitcoin and in in you know paying each other with things? Has it been a, a good uptake? So far, we have so two shops accepting Bitcoin. Our Bitcoin Chama Gym. So we have a gym. The gym is also accepting accept, accepting Bitcoin as a form of payment. Like if you come and you train, if you want to pay via Bitcoin, we accept that. The tricky bit is getting people to accept Bitcoin or to start using Bitcoin. But once they start using Bitcoin, that is it. Like once you start using Bitcoin, you're not going to stop. You're not going to, you, you will not go back to the fiat currency. So the tricky bit is getting these people to start using Bitcoin. And uh, these projects are the solution to adopting Bitcoin. Like if you give somebody a beehive and you tell them, I'm going to buy the honey from you at a better price, but I'm going to pay you in Bitcoin. That is like this person is going to take Bitcoin, is going to accept Bitcoin. And when you give them the the beehive, you're going to tell them, like, I, I think my brother did. I don't know if we told them, like, we gave them conditions and told them, okay, uh, we're going to, we will be the ones buying the honey from you and we're going to give you Bitcoin or we will have the Bitcoin classes at home. Uh, yeah, but but that is it. So once, once, um, once my community adopts Bitcoin, there is no way to stop that community from using Bitcoin. I think it's very exciting. Like there's, there's definitely a lot of these sort of communities around the world now. Um, I mean, you just look what go, what's going on, say, like in El Salvador, and there's that's almost like a whole country, isn't it? That's uh, that's kind of a, adopting it. It, it. it sounds like. Um, and yeah, I guess the more people that, um, sort of start adopting it and start using it, uh, the more kind of mainstream it comes because it's still like looked upon as, okay, cool. What's this like maybe fad, you know, by people that have no idea about it. Uh, so yeah. it sounds like, it, it sounds like it's sort of an educational thing. You know, you have to educate people on like, why it's good to use, why it's useful, and I guess how it can help them. And I think only once maybe they try, like you said, then they go, okay, cool. I can see a reason around this, you know, and um, yeah, your reasons are probably uh, much more important than lots of other people's as well, you know, just around the sort of uh, the privacy and um, the, yeah, and other reasons around that. So, so I think it's, I think it's really cool. Um, I did see that you'd also like, you know, you'd, you'd helped, guys pay for school fees and rent and all that sort of stuff using Bitcoin, which, um, you know, says a lot about you as a person. Like you, you seem like you, you know, you, like you said, you, you really want people to thrive. And that seems like yes. what is sort of ingrained in you. But how, how did that come about for you? Like that, that wanting for other people to do well. Growing up in, in my community, like you just want to better people's lives. It's just it comes naturally because I know once you go out there, you're going to find like things are so different. People out there 
you might have a neighbor, but you don't, you have never seen that person completely, maybe, or you don't know their name, or, you, you, or you've never heard their voice. But over here, like, in my community, we are like a family. So it's, it's, it's just how, I think it's, it's the case for most African countries or something. So growing up, I walk to school barefoot. Um, I'd fetch fetching water from. Like, actually, even last year, I was fetching water from our our stream, our spring. Sorry. Uh, so I don't know families like we've had electricity. My my family we've had electricity for five years, but I know families who who have had electricity for ten years, and the benefits of the electricity, even the lighting itself. Live alone using a blender and refrigerators because we don't have that but lighting alone because like whenever i install electricity uh whenever i connect these families to the grid they're not going to use the electricity for for blend to blend or refrigerate their food they're going to use electricity for lighting and maybe charging their phones or radio most people have phones actually almost every other family has got a phone at least so the lighting i was i was i was reading using uh, the kerosene lamps and like you wake up in the morning once you sleep you wake up in the morning and you find some black suit uh you know <laughs> yeah so i understand i've been living this life i understand what it is like not to have not to have electricity not to have clean water not to have uh fertilizer you, you have to use organic manures and all of that so once i have a way out like I, i'm saying for fossil fuels for africa that is a way out if i can get people to help my cause even better so i just want to help my community i want people to flourish i even my my fossil fuels for africa advocacy or my 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 organization is all about ensuring that africans flourish and we're going to keep the conversation around human flourishing africans the uh, flourishing the, i'm actually focus, more focused on africans the african and african flourishing and that is it how can people help you out thank you for asking so they can um i, I I'll, I'll share a link to if so okay let me put it like this so i have a buy me a coffee uh link they can buy me a coffee, buy me a coffee slash Jasper Machogu. Also, I have uh, for Bitcoiners, uh, Jasper Machogu at walletofsatoshi.com or something. I'm going to send you the links. Also, you can contact me personally if you want to be a part of the uh, projects that I I do at home. If you want somebody, maybe a family or two to get connected to the grid, uh, please feel free to reach out or something. I'd appreciate that. I mean, I encourage anyone that's that's listening, like you could, you never, like, you know, that, that sort of $200 that for, say, a lot of people that might be listening or watching, like, it's not really, say, a lot for them, but they, what that can do for a family in your village, like, I mean, it's, it's literally life-saving. I mean, just listening to you say, I mean, reading over kerosene lamp versus having a, a switch to, to switch on a light. Like, I mean, wow, the, the stuff I take for granted, like even just speaking to you and like, I think I'm already aware of like the sort of struggles of, of people say in Africa, cause I grew up in South Africa, you know, and, um, those struggles are real and you're exposed to them every single day. Um, but still you live a comfortable life. Like I'm talking about me, you know, like, and, uh, just, being reminded about that, like, you know, now is like, wow, we, we really need to sort of come together as like a humanity and start helping guys that are really in need. And I also think people don't realize like the sort of feedback loop on that, you know, like you might have this extra $200 and like say, send it to you and, uh, you help this family. And then one day this, this family and their kids, their kid becomes some, I don't know, like just some genius scientist that 
sort of create something that changes the world because he could now read his textbook or she could read her textbook like at night using a light as opposed to like a kerosene lamp. And she got to spend a few more hours because, you know, it was easier for her eyes and, uh, and, and, and that literally changed the world. So yeah, it, it is life changing stuff. So I really encourage anyone to sort of help you out and I'll share those links as well, uh, in the show notes and stuff. So, uh, Jasper, what's, mm-hmm. what excites you most about the future? Like, yeah. And how can people get in touch with you? So what excites me is the thought of a developed Africa, Africa, an Africa that has Africans who have, uh, who have access to electricity, who have access to clean cooking, clean tap water, or just clean water. The thought of a flourishing Africa just excites me and I know we're going to achieve it thanks to good leadership and once we beat the neo-colonial IMF, the UN, uh, World Bank and all of those organizations and the green organizations that are all about ensuring that Africa never develops. I'm also excited when I think of us using our own resources, our own oil, our own natural gas, our own coal, our own gold using our natural resources to better our lives. That excites me. Uh, so people can contact me uh, at Jasper Machogu on Twitter, Substack. I mostly use those two, Jasper Machogu on Twitter, Substack. Okay, that's super cool. I, it reminds me what you're saying. I, I read this other book uh, years ago as well called The Hydrogen Economy. And um, it, it was also like a really fascinating book because it spoke about the potential of using hydrogen as energy. So like, you know, hydrogen is obviously, you know, part of what's just in the air, but also, you know, hydrogen is in water. And one of the things that they spoke about in the book was that if a country like Africa, which has like tons of hydrogen available, if they could tap into the hydrogen economy, they would, they would, essentially become like the strongest continent in the world because at the moment they, they a lot of their money and a lot of their debt is effectively used to pay off like fossil fuel you know right so they, they buy a lot of fossil fuels but uh, they've also been given these sort of nasty contracts whereby they're kind of always in debt and like most of the money that they make you know through their gdp and stuff is actually just paying off debt so they never actually have money to invest in important projects like schools or, um, you know, architecture or uh, transportation or, or whatever it is, roads, um, water access, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a very interesting book. And it kind of like, you know, th- th- that's how Africa starts flourishing when you, when you sort of start having, um, you know, you, you start being able to invest in things that are important um, and, and entirely necessary. So I also believe that there's um there's so much hope for for africa like as a continent like you know i I also remember years ago i I was like super interested in in politics and i was like i want to go and be president in south africa right (laughs) crazy idea (laughs) and and um the i I was i was reading about south africa and it it was like at the time it was something like one of the only self-sustainable countries in the world like we had our own oil we had our own food, we had our own like water, we had everything. Like, like it didn't need to sort of import anything whatsoever. So therefore, immediately you you have control of your currency and your and your money and your debt. Right. But you know, of course, governments, I don't know, I think they're just the most corrupt institutions in the world. And they uh they just sort of want to line their own pockets, it seems a lot of the time, these politicians. Um but I think a lot of Africa is like that. I think a lot of Africa is kind of like, you know, self-sustainable. I mean, the whole continent is totally self-sustainable and certain countries are definitely self-sustainable. So the hope is there, but um, it just, it's going to take people like yourselves um, to, to just sort of keep on, keep on flipping, speaking the good game, you know, and waking people up. So, so I'm, I'm really excited about that too. And I look forward to 
to seeing you as the president of, of Kenya one day, brother. <laughs> uh, just, just kidding. I'm sure you don't want to do that. But uh, my, my last question, you know, my last question is, uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Helping people out, helping the poor. Yeah. yeah. And this has been a fantastic reminder about it. So I just wanted to say like, thanks so much for coming on the, on the podcast, but it's, uh, been really special like i you know really enjoyed chatting to you and, and thanks for just explaining i guess the hardships of you know what it is to live the life that you live you know and also to give that sense of reality for all these uh sort of academics that are you know writing these ridiculous sort of policies and papers and stuff like you know you guys need to sort of wake up and come come live a day in the lives of a guy like jasper to to sort of make sense of what what you're actually writing um so i think you know i know there's a lot of support for you like i i what i you know i've checked your your feed on twitter and the comments and stuff and there's lots of people rooting for you and you know believing in i guess what 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 you're doing and and that's the cool thing about humanity i think deep down inside like we actually do want to help each other you know um and uh, i think that's that's also the hope that i think i have have when it comes to sort of civilization is that we actually do want to help each other most of us you know and there's always the other side but um but yeah just wanted to say a massive thanks for coming on and uh just looking forward to hopefully meeting you in person one day ah thank you thank you for having me yeah i, I look forward to that